you just start singing. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. What do you mean? You just said it <laughs> with or without yeah. you. No. I, I, if you, do you want people to actually cry? No, listen, I've, <laughs> I've, I've done the worst version of Queen and David Bowie under pressure. I personally have done that. And I, I, I no way. I, yeah, it's out, it's out there. It's out there. Yeah, that's the problem, you see. Yeah, I have one video that's out there that's done the rounds, and that's the last video that's going to do the rounds ever. Is there ever. no song, like some little song? How, how old are your kids? Um, They've gone past the pet the pig. <laughs> there, I'll deal with that if you want to sing that for a little bit. That's totally no. cool with me. No, no. Not Come on, on a Friday. This t- no, no, not happening. Maybe if we had some uh, of um, McGregor's whiskey... Uh, a couple of those that's on your end I, I i haven't had a client or a guest i haven't had a guest come in yet but they've been bringing some booze for me and they bring it but we don't drink it on the time there so can you hum anything anything at all listeners are going to be a little upset because they'll be like everybody has to sing hum. Huh? Mm. <laughs> go with that do that a little bit i'm totally cool with that gavin yeah yeah so are we going to meditate like before we actually do sure, the, the podcast? Totally do Is that, that what you want to do? You want to do that? You yeah. can do that. Well, yeah. go ahead. We're recording. So whenever you're ready. <laughs> That's it. We'll, we'll live with that. Gavin, thank you so much, man. Welcome to the show. <laughs> How are you? I'm great good. to be here. I'm good. I'm loving. I'm loving that I'm speaking to you. You're in Ireland. What part of Ireland are you in? We're just outside Dublin, okay. um, probably 20 minutes from the city centre in a, a, a place called Selbridge, which is well known for one famous person called Arthur Guinness. I, I've uh, consumed a few of his <laughs> pints, I would say. <laughs> yes. I actually, yes. I love going to Guinness there. I, uh, we, we didn't want to leave. And then I, I love that. Is it right that Jameson is right down the street, right? Yes. It's um, right, yeah, it's right down the street. So you can have your beer, of, you can have your whiskey. All, yeah. Yeah. yeah really nice. It's a it's a phenomenal success story and it is a phenomenal uh tourist attraction for Ireland. If you take everything else out of Ireland, the one thing that you you could never take out is the Guinness storehouse uh, yeah. experience. It's yeah. millions of people yeah. per year at uh, that go to that uh go to that factory <clears throat> i, I love me. the story behind him and what he did with uh what was it a nine thousand year lease with yes the government is it nine thousand right. year yeah yeah some t- I, i'm not sure the exact uh, but it was something some insane number but yeah, I mean, it made a lot of number. sense yeah what what a, what a revolutionary um visionary if you like in yeah. terms of being able to do that and to see that and to know and then to pull it all together like you know uh, even today's talk a lot of things won't get done unless there's collaboration and yep. every moving part coming together in one momentum. All right. So we got to let everybody know what we're going to be talking about. We're obviously we're going to be talking about safety and there's a lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of concern about it. And I love that you approached me and we got talking and it's been a little while. You're busy. Everybody's busy. So we finally got you on the show, but I do love yeah. speaking to people outside of Canada. Uh, it's not that I'm done speaking to all the Canadians here. Uh, I'm just yeah. getting started, but I do love having uh, conversations with people outside of the country about uh, what's going on and, and especially in safety, safety is paramount in construction and all that comes other industries as well. So I love, what you're doing so let me just Kevin let me share the deets to everybody uh Gavin Coyle is here CEO and founder of the Coyle Group uh he's a thought leader uh a speaker safety mentor been doing it for 25 years websites are triple w gavin hyphenated coil.com and also triple w coil hyphenated group.com his email to reach him is gavin at gavin hyphenated coil.com and you'll find him on LinkedIn you'll find him on I- IG under Gavin Coil 10 the number 10 and also you'll find him on YouTube YouTube, the safety CEO is the channel. Quick shout out to Adam Gordon. I'm wearing his tea. Thank you so much. Your stickers are still on the table here. So people have been taking them. Uh, and everyone's loving your plumbers uh, round table that you're a part of, which is great. And that's it, man. That's my shout outs. That's what I've done. That's that's the grocery list, Gavin. Now we get to talk to you. Uh, where do you want to begin? I would like to talk about the business of safety. Um it's something that's very close to where I am um, from a professional and personal point of view at the moment. And 
I'm trying to reach out to as many people as I can to get people to think about safety as a profit center for their business and not to think of it as a compliance tick the box department or function. I like that. Is that is that a loaded question? No, loaded it's not. Statement? I actually like that. <laughs> That's the first time that I've thought about it that way because I think the majority of people think about it the way that you just described it. Yeah. Yes. I like that. They think um, when people talk about safety, they don't generally like to think about the fact that we want them to talk about reducing their spend on safety and um, on the basis of that reduction to repurpose that money into a more impactful uh, measured outcome so what does that look like and yeah. how do you get to that point and give us some examples and this is where we're talking to as many people as I can and then we obviously produced the book uh, workplace safety on a budget okay. so that nobody can turn around and say uh, safety is a class system in the sense that if you have more money well then you'll have better safety or gotcha. I don't have enough money therefore I can't afford health and safety so in the book we have what we like to call the hacks on how to do safety on a budget where can we find the book amazon.com okay that's beautiful because i've had yeah. guests on the show before where they we were talking for about 90 minutes and all of a sudden at the very end they brought up the book and i was like okay gavin knows what he's doing <laughs> man he's bringing up the book right off the bat which is great so yeah. okay uh what was the title so, of the book uh, again somebody said to me before you're you're, you're selling from day one gavin <laughs> um, so, uh, some people think you're in them in their own business um, why okay you know gavin no why did you get into this segment of the business why did you why safety so i came out of school um straight into construction working as a laborer on building sites and at the time in ireland there was a massive influx of u.s companies like intel hewlett packard compaq Glaxo, Smith, Lang Beach and Warner Lambert, which is now Pfizer's and so on. And like they were just coming in, building hyperscale projects, a uh, couple of thousand people, construction workers on the project. And safety was not a full time role within Ireland at that time. So uh, nobody's seen us as a you wouldn't have a safety officer uh, on the job full time. What just was can I ask you, Gavin, it wasn't. It. What was um, what was the safety record like at that time? in ireland very good question um the statistics weren't really being pulled together either at that stage like we were working off an act so originally it was a factories act which was very well like it was back in the 50s and 60s i think the factories act and then they overhauled it in 1989 um with the 1989 act and we're we've come a long way since then but at the time safety was poor uh we have to uh, we'd have to put our hands up there and um we were probably very, very uh, well behind the curve in terms of uh, health and safety. And in fairness to these American uh, companies, and you can say whatever you want, whether they're capitalists or whatever else, it, it didn't matter. They brought with them module models, uh, safety models that they were using on their other projects in the States. And yeah, you might look back at it now and say, bit of a day now, but at the time, you know, there was a lot of sense to what they were bringing and they forced, if you like, the Irish um, industry to step up for health and safety because they didn't want the fatality on their project uh, or attached to their name. And therefore, I got the finger pointed at me from our construction company to say, look, you're out of school. All of our guys are flat out. Yeah. You know, you're going to that safety meeting and whether you like it or not we need you to to do that and it was a con to be honest with you it was more them saying look we don't have time for this you can do it so um i actually loved it i loved the whole concept of saving people looking at uh how people can be um safe in the workplace and making sure they go home safe uh so you know um fell in love with it and then the company then started asking me to look at look after more and more projects. So I become sort of a floating safety officer going across uh, projects in Europe and uh, anywhere where there was, uh, this company was expanding and they were expanding at a, at a, at a big rate. And then uh, I suppose about a year or two years into it, um, I was on a project we were building, we we're doing a, um, a hotel for the Four Seasons Hotel. And um, there was a bang on the door 
uh, man down, man down. And when I went out to the job, there was one of our young guys had fallen into a hole head first and oh. we had to pull him out of the hole. I went with him in the ambulance and he died a day later from his injuries. So very traumatic experience. Yeah. It was carnage in the ambulance. It was carnage in the A&E and then having to deal with the aftermath of the fatality and all the stuff that comes with that, like prosecutions and, you know, uh, dealing with the family and all that kind of stuff. So um, got a very uh, raw taste of what goes wrong when safety is not achieved or, or not adhered to. And then from a personal point of view, within a 24 month period, my brother drowned along with two of his friends when they oh were ball, throwing a ball to each other Yeah, uh, on the Atlantic coast. They were just literally throwing a football to each other and a freak wave came in and then the undercurrent swept them out to sea and uh, three of them drowned. So that was a personal tragedy and a career tragedy all within a sort of 24 month period. So had to put on my big boy pants and say, look, you know, is safety really for you? You know, this, this is this, do you really want to continue here? And I made the decision, yeah, this is something I really want to, I'm passionate about. And if, now I've had these sort of trauma uh, events thrown at me, I was able to manage that. And I, there was no counseling or anything at the time. No. When you look back at it now, like, you know, you'd have to get some sort of counseling for that type of stuff. But it didn't affect me like the way it would affect others. And I just, it actually made me more stronger and more sort of resilient to, uh, you know, I'm more passionate, obviously. I hope that comes across in, in the talk that we have. Yeah. Um, I'm very focused on on health and safety. I'm very proud of our reputation in terms of where we're at as a company and as uh, as a group. We've, we've, we've done some very big projects for, for very big clients on very complex situations. But the issue that I always felt was because we were premium service, we supply or outsource health and safety people that are 20 plus years experience <clears throat> only in the energy uh, power generation, wind energy, utility sectors. And we created a niche for ourselves, but a lot of small to medium enterprises would have contacted me looking for help. And yes, we, I'd give them as much support as I could, but they couldn't meet the, the rates that we charge for safety people because we have a cost base and that, you know, that just didn't fit into the small to medium enterprise. So it was kind of, something that was gnawing at me for years was like, how do I get to these people and give them some sort of support? So I set up gavin-coil.com with a view to um, giving people access to health and safety at a very reasonable rate. So we're putting on free uh, safety courses that people can go to. We're putting on, you know, $29.99 courses, uh, $29 courses for people we're giving them free toolkits and templates and forms. We're giving them downloadable forms, very cheap as well. We're trying to put as much stuff into that website so that people can have access to safety at all levels. And there isn't this class system or this yeah. mythology that there's a class system in health and safety. But you're also educating these people as well too, right? So obviously they're yeah. learning from it and then you're getting more and more people sharing that knowledge and speaking about it instead of frowning upon it like the way you said at the very beginning where it makes yeah. more sense right yeah and and hopefully that they'll pass that on to other people and that they'll create cultures within their companies and that they'll embrace health and safety and when, when i talk about the business of safety like we have a, a case study where we save the company over a million euro uh, just using that logic of changing your mindset to think about safety as a profit center. And in that particular case, we were brought in to look at, this, at a particular company. And when we uh, done some discovery on it, we found out that they had over a hundred guys that were working in these chambers in the ground. And when I, we spoke to these guys, they were actually employed to work on electrical poles as in totally opposite to where they were. Okay. Uh, but because their company had won this major contract, their company said, look, great we have this great contract you guys are going to get more money you've got more sustainability you got a future a bigger future with us now because we have this big contract however you're going to have to change your job um now it wasn't a competency based uh role but it's, so they were overqualified even to do this work but because of the nature of the job and the client they the guys reluctantly done it so when we spoke to them you know Kind of, they were demotivated to be fair, um, because okay. uh, they weren't doing what they were trained to do, you know. So, 
we put a plan in place with the with the company with the, the leaders of the company and said look there's some really good contractors out there that only do that particular task if we can put together a tender you have all the knowledge you've got all the resources you know how much materials equipment and how much time it takes to do that job so now you can, you've got a great opportunity to put together a tender document that actually you know inside out exactly how much this costs you and how much you can save and how much you can bring in somebody to do this job safely, but also on budget. And so we introduced them to a company, not that we're saying that we were pushing them, but they ended up going with that particular company out of the three companies that they looked at. And that company then became a bigger company because obviously they won that contract and then all these guys got taken out of the hole and got repurposed back into what they were actually employed to do, yeah. which allowed capacity for more work to be won by that particular company doing what they are, their core business is. And then this other side, this contractor company just belted on with the, with the job, um, uh, delighted that they'd won this contract. And, you know, when we spoke to the owners a year later, they were like, you know, sometimes we just didn't see it. Yeah. We didn't see that in front of us. And it took someone like ourselves, I'm not patting ourselves on the back because, you know, what we got out of it was bigger because we said, hold on a minute here. This is right across the board. People are not really looking at safety in such a way to say, hey, are we doing things that we shouldn't be doing? What is our core expertise? Why aren't we doing more of what we're actually really good at? And why are we getting pulled into stuff that, you know, is not relevant or not as um, profitable yeah. or not as safe? Um when other people could really do that for us. Is it, I mean, Gavin, you could tell me more. Um, when, a, when a person wants to have a conversation about safety, is it they avoid having the conversation until they actually they have to have the conversation because an accident has happened at that time? Yeah. yeah. That's generally, and I think that's unfortunate and it's also global. I think that's just, you know, your side of the yeah. pond, my side, it, it's, it's just how it is. Yeah. And I think that you're right to say that it doesn't matter if it's a small business or a large corporation you have to have these conversations and you have to address it and prevent it from anything happening because the whole mm -hmm. idea is that you know you you've hired so many people to do a, a job you want every single one of those people to go home you don't yes. you don't want to lose a single person from there right so are we i, no. can, I want to go back to the very beginning it's like are we talking about just the bare bones basics are we are, are people in the construction industry, all, all levels, industrial, commercial, residential, is it as simple as people are not wearing their lids, they're not wearing their hard hats, and it's just, uh, it's a head, con you know, head traumas and all kinds of things like that. Are we, are we past that or are we educated enough now that every single person that works in construction has a lid on their head and they're, they're fine with it? Ah, look, I, I suppose it, you can't really, um, you can't really uh, have a definitive answer on that, depending on the country you go to, whether yeah. there'll be standards and, and more, less standards and more standards, depending on which country you go to. Um, if you want to generalize it, we're still having the same problems. We're still injuring people the same way. Predominantly work at heights, you know, impact from machinery and equipment, manual handling. It's just coming up year after year. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Why are we not? solving the problem what's going on and you know there's there's multitude of answers to that you know one of the probably biggest ones is is there's a, a low barrier to entry into the construction segment yeah you know you can basically walk into a building site today and and get a job you know um and that's unfortunate and some people can capitalize on that and we've seen it and then what's happening is uh Companies are getting smarter in the sense that why why should we be digging the hole when we can get him to dig the hole and we just you know make the money off him? Yeah. So now all of a sudden this guy becomes one man in the van becomes one man and two vans becomes ten men and ten vans, yeah. and he never even thought about getting into business and now all of a sudden he has this monster developed because the other company have capitalized on the fact that we they've decided no we're just, we're just going to manage people because we know how to manage people we know how to manage projects and we're going to get these little guys and then what we're going to do is we're going to offset our profit and loss and we're going to offset our liabilities by and we're going to create a better cash flow model for ourselves by outsourcing all of this work and we won't tell the clients that we have a model of subcontractors to subcontractor to subcontractor 
and we'll just t- we, we're we're intelligent enough to win these contracts. We'll win the contracts and we'll outsource it to these guys. Uh, it's construction. That's construction, but that's so. I suppose we'll answer your question about health and safety. You can't really solve safety until you solve procurement. That's actually a very good point. But how do you solve that problem? How do you get the profiteering corporations to understand these problems first? Well, we've got to we've got to have an acknowledgement that people are, you know, by the very nature of people, we all want to win work. We all want more money. We all want more profit. We all want to be patted on the back for winning major projects. But what's happening is people are tendering out uh, on major projects that probably they don't have the skill set or capacity to deliver. They might have it for one particular project, but not for a multitude of projects. So, you know, we all know that what's happening. The tenders come in, the guys put in as many of these tenders, fill them out as many as they can, and let's see what sticks. And then all of a sudden they've won a contract or they're on an existing contract and someone says, hey, you know that contract down in you know, Toronto? Yeah, you won that contract. So now all of a sudden he has to tool up within the space of a month or two months. He doesn't have the capacity. Nobody's asking Nobody's asking the relevant question, which is, do you have the capacity or, or how many uh, jobs or um, operations have you got on right now that you can actually tell me with confidence that you can deliver this job on time, on budget, with safety? Who's going out to these companies before they actually award them a contract and say, I want to speak to all your guys on the ground. I want to speak to your managers. I want to get a flavor for who you are yeah. as a company. I want to understand your culture. I want to understand how you how you move as a company. And then I want to benchmark you and say, Do you know what? You're not a tier one. You're not a tier two, but you're a tier three. And we're happy to work with you at a tier three level. And we're happy to give you work at tier three level. But that actually means that you're going to be fitted into a 200K bracket or a 500K bracket or whatever that bracket is. And this is back to the business of safety again. This all ties in with the business of safety. There's other stuff that I can go on and talk about. Yeah, no, day, I want you to continue. I wanted to ask you a question about, are they tendering these subcontractors to do the work because of a, they literally want to uh, insulate themselves legally? Yes. That's 100%. the number. That's what's what all it's about, right? So then they, 100%. they've tendered yeah. it out to somebody else. They do the work. And then if something does happen, which odds are it might. Yeah. They're insulated now. Yeah, hundred percent. If you read the fine line, the fine print on uh, these guys are so intelligent at. And I'm not having a go at these these people. This is like, you know, uh, you know, they've made a very smart move that they said to themselves, "Look, we're not going to be the contractor anymore. We're going to be the project managers. We're going to be like a project management company." Um, we know how to do these jobs. We know what the client expects. We know how to execute the job. We know where to get the people. We know how much it's going to cost. Little old Gavin over here with the one man in the van, he's not as intelligent at this stuff, but I know he's really good at actually putting his head down and getting the job done. So we're going to use him as the the guy that's actually going to do the job, but we're going to polish things off and we're going to be the one that's, that's the face of yeah. the client. And so when something goes wrong or if the money side of things goes wrong, little old Gavin and the one man in the van gets hit first because he's hasn't got time to think about what's going on <clears throat> up here because he's too focused on the day-to-day stuff imagine this you're working on a construction project and accidentally damage a client's property without insurance you could be held responsible for the repair costs and what about unforeseen accidents that can happen on a job site construction projects come with their fair share of risks if a third party gets injured you could be facing medical expenses legal fees and even potential settlements but with construction liability insurance those expenses are covered saving you from a significant financial burden Every construction professional needs a margin of safety and a solid backup plan for when things go wrong. So if you're a general contractor, renovation expert, or a construction professional, don't leave your business vulnerable. Nail down the low-cost construction liability insurance you need and get a certificate of insurance quickly by getting a free quote now by visiting zensurance.com forward slash save 35. Zensurance is Canada's leading source for small business and construction liability insurance. I remember my first year in construction, <clears throat> I was having a lot of conversations with other tradespeople and just talking about, and, and we discuss all kinds of stuff. It could be skills, it yeah. could be running a business, it could be safety, it could be a bunch of stuff. But I was amazed to have a, com- a few conversations where we're talking about certain people that got hurt. And it's kind of the same thing. When you get a motorcycle, for whatever reason, people want to have conversations about motorcycle crashes. And I'm like, I'm not interested in having conversations about that. But with construction, I yeah. want to learn about it. And people were yeah. sharing about, 
other stories, someone lost a finger, someone lost a hand, someone lost a leg or whatever. And then they started talking about the settlements that were attached to it and the value that was yeah. put towards parts of yeah. bodies. And I, and I was just in awe that someone actually sat down and put a figure associated with a person or a person's part. And it just, yeah. I don't get that. And I get that that's where the companies are coming in and they look at that and yeah. they, they figure, well, how bad is our safety record? And it, what's the potential of losses regarding that safety record? Or if we actually try to improve our safety record, you know, what's that going to cost us to do that? Or the kind of worker that we're going to need to get. And it's just a shame that there's a, a chart, there's a, a flow, like that they yeah. just break it down that way. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of insight into that. Yeah. Uh, well, the book of quantum is is the famous book yeah. that they, they <clears throat> tell you how much your fingers worth and tell you how much your, which fingers worth which. And it, it, <clears throat> it's sad to think that we have to, that we're down to that stage that we have a book that actually dictates how much money we're actually valued at in terms of if something goes wrong with a, with a, with a body part. Um, and unfortunately as well, if, if you're not married, or it's fortunately, less, it's whichever less. way you want to look at it. Yeah, it's true. You know, that's another way of looking at it. Like if, if you've got dependents, it means your money goes up in terms of if you're, if you're dead on a building site, you know, your family's going to get more money. But if you're just on your own, they won't, the, the, the payout won't be as much. It's 15,000. I think in the States, it's 15,000 is the average payout for, um, for a, a workplace accident. Um, a death or a part? Uh, no, no, that's just a that's just a, a fine from a fine. Oh, point just of view, a fine. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, from sorry for penalties, but yeah. um, look, we're not there. Um, we we keep on dressing up safety. New stuff comes out, but it's not really new. It's just repurposed, and it's it's all smoke and mirrors. It's not really a, making a, uh, it's not making an impact at the, at the grassroots level. What do you um, want to see, some people, Kevin? Like, <clears> I want to see it. Yeah. I want to see it unpacked, and I want to see it re re engineered. And as well as that, health and safety, um, and they're going to be probably uh, dragged through the coals over this, but health and safety as a occupation has has not been structured correctly. And what I mean by that is it's too broad a subject. You know, the best safety people we have working for us um, down through the years has always been somebody that had a primary degree in like the likes of engineering, where they think of things logically and they go back to root cause. Yeah. And then they work them way from there all the way to the accident and they go, yeah, now I know what happened here. Now we can address that. And I use the term loose safety people. When you see a loose safety officer, it means like someone's come out of college. They know a bit about everything, but they don't know enough about the actual industry or the specific task or the specific uh, subject that's been addressed. And uh, if anyone's listened to this podcast, which I'm sure there's a lot of people, yeah. if you do take on a health and safety person, whatever you do, make sure that they have a specific focus and uh, within the industry that you're in, um, and they're not coming from another industry and bringing that bias or that own logic into your logic, because it won't work. And you know, we would generally say to people, try and organically bring somebody through your company like the way I did, where people get to know your business inside out, get to know your culture, and then you fast track them if they have a grow or an empathy for safety into the into the safety field. That's the best safety people that we've seen um, being produced is, is the, you know, the uh, organic uh, ecosystem. Well, it's, it's unfortunate too, and I agree with you, Gavin, <clears throat> on all those points there, that these people that are being given the positions of health and safety uh, inspectors, if you will, they're just being streamlined by the government to push them in. So they're not being any better than the profiteering organizations that are tendering out to subcontractors. So it's like, you're not focusing on the problem. You're just filling yes. the quota. You're filling the mandate that the public is possibly asking. And we get this all the time in North yeah. America where I remember, I'm sure that you remember a few years back, New York was having crane fall after crane fall after crane fall. And there was so much. And yeah. it was just because all these cranes were going up so quickly and construction standards were just being dropped. And then all of a sudden you had an accident. And it wasn't until all those accidents happened that you get politicians coming on board and started saying, we need to get more inspectors on. And we need to get, but you're right. These people are coming out doing a course, showing up on a job site and not really understanding what they need to do. Yeah, the damage in the name for safety because the guys are very smart, obviously on the ground and they know there's job inside out and they can see you come on a mile away. 
and they can tell you what they need to tell you in order to get rid of you yeah. out of their way and they can orchestrate and they're very good they're very the lads are, the lads on the ground are sharp as razors but you know, imagine the conversation where you the respect is too is twofold it goes both ways and the guy on the ground actually recognizes do you know what i need this guy I need the safety guy because this safety guy is actually making sense. He's actually making my job a lot easier. And he's actually been the one that has, you know, facilitated a conversation to make life better within the workplace because we got better tools, we got better equipment. I'm getting great training. We're on jobs that I love, really nice jobs that are safe. There's nothing as good as the atmosphere on a job that's actually moving. Yeah. The momentum is, is moving at a really great pace and everybody knows that everybody's making good money on the job. Everybody's happy going to work and, you know, there's no drama. And I, you know, I, I don't see enough of those projects uh, and I don't get out to the field as much the, these days, but when I do, you know, I don't see enough of those feel good projects that are going on because, you know, things are being driven into the ground and people are just, I suppose, getting demoralized and demotivated. And we're going to find it hard to fill the gaps in construction and, uh, in, in the future and we're already finding it in health and safety there's a massive gap of health and safety professionals is it, is it just uh, in a, the a, global industry is it just a powder keg now gavin is that what we're looking at that we have to have some pretty traumatic situations come up on construction sites for people to start paying attention to health and safety look i don't think people are reckless let's 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 call it spade a spade yeah. the, the, the days of you know you're going to do that whether you like it or not they're yeah, gone that's gone you know that doesn't yeah, exist on any i don't well it depends on certain places in the world but i don't think over there or over here it's not happening that way anymore no no, no. people yeah, there is a, there is that respect is there now but the issue is competency like we're putting incompetent people into competent positions because the lack of resources and the lack of capacity to de to to deliver jobs and the lack of availability of people in the global markets, whether it's safety, engineering, construction, doesn't matter. There's there's more work than there is people, and productivity has gone down. And without getting into the social economical conversation of where we are as a a global economy, uh, safety is going to get hit because, um. You know, things are going to fall through the cracks. And I sound like I'm a sort of doom. I'm the doom guy here. No, like you're this, being realistic, you know. Gavin. You're just talking the truth because you've seen it firsthand and you've been on job sites and I've seen it myself too. And it's just like I've, I've had situations happen and I've heard of other situations. It wasn't that long ago here that I guess through social media, the word got out that there was a death on a job site and it, it moves pretty quickly at that point, right? And the thing yeah. is that it could be avoided. That's the thing about yeah. it, that you could do certain things to avoid it. Well, Manny, it, it's interesting you should bring that up because um, I had this conversation with someone recently. I've dealt with a number of fatalities just um, in terms of construction projects where we've been asked to come in and do a, an investigation post the accident or the fatality. And it's amazing the momentum that builds up after a fatality where everybody's just on it in terms of health and safety. You know, the housekeeping is perfect. Guys are like pulling each other and saying, hey, you know, don't do that. You know, and it's all the stuff that should be happening Before. as a culture within yeah. your company. Yeah. And then within six to eight months, we usually it's about an eight month period. Next thing it starts to drop, drop on back, going back to where it was. It starts to default back to where people were. And, you know, that's a that's a real shame to, that I can actually visibly see people you know, being safe and acting safe and being and being, you know, um, looking out for each other. Yeah. To go on, you know, I'm just gonna go on, crack back on, do what I have to do because I have enough on my plate, and I'm just gonna focus on what I'm doing. Um, you know, there's a whole psychological element to health and safety that people are trying to tap into now, in terms of you know people bringing in mental health and stress and all stuff, and now the owner of the business becomes obliged and now legally uh, obliged to manage the mental health of people and sort of you know that gives for me gives safety a bad name because now you're stretching it into yeah. areas where there's there's personal stuff that's you know we're not equipped as a business owners or construction owners to deal with and now like in in europe they've got mental health first aiders and so it means like you know i'm going up to an ordinary guy maybe a bricklayer or, or labor it doesn't matter who they are and say hey hey do you want to be a mental health first aider what's involved well it's a two-day course i think it could be a one-day course and if somebody's feeling bad or having a down day 
they're going to go to you and you're going to sit with them in the cab and they're going to have a chat with them. Are you kidding like, who's me? Qualif- yeah. I swear to God, I swear. I, I, I like, know I over here God, that but, like, they've been getting more sensitive about it. And, and I've discussed it a few times on the show. And like you said, as a, as a business owner, like, let, let's not talk about the big corporations and high rise industrial. Like that. No. Let's talk about just a small business owner. Like I'm a one or two person shop and I renovate and I do yeah. small jobs or whatever. I don't have that. Like, I don't have that luxury. I have my own mental no. problems going on in my own family, in my own situation, right? And it's just like, yeah. I find it really troubling that their work and their personal is superseding my work and my personal. Where, where, yeah. where Where's my situation now? And I don't, I mean, I guess it sounds okay on paper and it fits, it checks certain boxes to have a, a mental health first aid responder, but does yeah. it really do anything? at that point well like who's qualifying these people this is this that's like people go to college for seven years to, to study psychology and now we're handing people layman people uh the role of mental health first aiders to talk to somebody that might be on the verge of suicide or whatever sorry for i don't want to use the word suicide no but, no but you're right you know yeah, it's having true. a bad day like like and, and to circle back to where we started this conversation there is an argument for the companies that I spoke about that should be, you know, we talked about they're, they're now becoming project management companies rather than contractors. Yeah. Their argument will be, well, Gavin, yeah, mental health is an exact uh, scenario. We don't want to get involved with that crap. We just want to deliver the job. And if we start doing the work ourselves, we now have to employ all these people, which should, we have to address all these issues. And, you know, we're, we're just outsourced that. And, you know, little old Gavin in his van, he doesn't realize that he has now to look after the mental health of his workers as well as everything else. We don't have to deal with that anymore, Gavin. So this is, you know, that's, that they will make that argument to me. See, that's and more, it's a fair argument. That's more insulating at that point. That's all it is, right? So they're profiting, they're delivering the scope, they get the job done, then they get awarded another job because that job was done. But then yeah. lower down the line, you can't forget, you can't forget the crew. And I mean, like, it's it's kind of daunting. I know that from speaking to a lot of kids that I've got into in construction, safety mm. and the risk of being hurt is is huge on their mind about whether or not to get in or even stay in and and be a tradesperson at that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that if a lot of business owners or corporations started factoring in everybody that's on the crew, more importantly, yeah. then it'd be a different model at that point. Right. Yeah. I, I, I like we should we should uh, safety should be in, in t- integrated within your function as a as a um, apprentice or as a, whatever trade you're doing. Safety should be part. Of, there should be, you know, a module or a couple of modules on safety, and you, you need to be you need to pass that as a minimum requirement. So, like, you know, a lot of stuff in safety, and I again, I sound like I'm doomsday here, but a lot of stuff is reactive and it's sort of just yeah. It's it's supporting legal logic and insurance logic rather than actual business logic. Um, and I know I keep on banging the drum on the business of safety. This is why I think people, you know, people have turned off on safety for that reason. It's kind of like, ah, look, we just throw a load of paperwork at it. And as, as the saying goes, you can't have enough paper. You know, if something goes wrong, well, he signed this and he signed this and he signed this and he signed this and he signed this. Go and ask him, did he actually read the document? Go and ask him about the document and go and ask him, you know, challenge him on the on the content of the document. And to be fair, there's so much paperwork being pushed at these guys. They're not going to know. They are not going to know. And I've set in, I've done an exercise with some companies where we've brought in management teams and I've said to them, didn't tell them what was going to happen. Didn't didn't say anything. Came into the cabin and said, "Look, this is totally confidential. You know, whatever it says is here. You you just dump it on me." It says, "I'm not going to. Your name is not going to be on anything. We're just going to take notes and we're going to bring it back and we're going to try and make the company better because they're more informed about you know stuff that you might say." Yeah. So once they're relaxed and you have that relaxed attitude, man, Manny, they open up. Okay. So then I say to them things like. You've got a phone, a phone call just came into the office and it's from the Sun newspaper. And they're saying that you guys killed a guy today and that uh, uh, the ambulance has just left the construction project. And 
we're sending a journalist to the hospital. Have you anything to say to us? Okay. Yeah, there's just the guys just go like, um, yeah. yeah. Well, who's responsible for safety within your organization? Um, the safety manager is he? So and again, straight away we're getting in, we're getting feedback here on how these guys are going to respond in a trauma situation. So number one, they think that's they think that the safety officer is responsible for health and safety. So there's a straight away red flag. Yeah. A hundred percent. No, sorry. I'm just making notes as we're talking because of stuff that, <laughs> questions I want to ask you, Gavin. Uh, no, no, you're, you're totally like, right. So it's like, it, 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 yeah, go ahead. No, but, the, 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 you know, do, do, uh, do, is there an issue? Have you, like this guy fell from height. Do you think, is there issues going on in, in work at height issues in your, in your, yeah, well, we've spoken to the, the foreman for loads of time about, you know, having ladders tied off and he, they never listen. Oh, do they not? Boom, boom, boom. Next thing, all of a sudden, the guys are dumping all of the stuff uh, to us of all the issues that they see that they wouldn't or that they've said and nobody listened and nobody uh, made uh, sort of an impact or or solved for them and what we're what we're saying to the owners is what these guys are saying to us is what they're going to say to an inspectorate or to a, a health and safety authority and so they're better off saying it to us now so you're going to know that this is this is coming for you unless you address and sort of solve these areas and you know you've got you've now got a culture where these guys are actually they're going to throw you under the bus because they're going to tell the truth and they're not they're not going to lie and they're going to say exactly what is in their head they might be saying it to you because they might have switched off because you at some point you didn't listen to something that these guys were saying or you haven't created a culture where there it is an open dialogue on health and safety so there's a, okay so i got a bunch gavin um so here's the thing okay. uh over here we get a lot of frustration from health and safety inspectors where they will show up on a job site, whether they've been notified or they just accidentally came across and saw a job site and just want to walk in. And they may see something that is in violation, but then you ask them, how am I supposed to make that safe? And it's a constant, exactly, right? And the thing is their go-to response every single time, not my responsibility to show you how to make it safe, you have to make it safe. But yeah, you're you need to that. demonstrate to me. Yes, you need to demonstrate to me that you're in control. I, uh, if I have to tell you what to do, well then, uh, I'm kind of leaving myself legally and liable open to prosecution. So I can't tell you, but I can, I can tell, I can ta- can't tell you what you've done wrong, but I can tell you that I'm going to prosecute you if you do wrong. <laughs> But that's not, that's not the How's that supposed to help me? It's not exactly. And that's what I have a problem with. And the other thing is, as you were talking, which was great, I, I, I love that you were having a Q&A and a focus group and talking about this in this scenario. And two yeah. things came up is that there's been a lot of people recently, been a lot of people, we had somebody on the show, she spoke up and she was terminated in a roundabout way to not become legally liable by the union or by the actual corporation hiring her, right? And yeah, so yeah. she she saw what was going on and she brought it to the right people and the right people ignored it and then she continued to bring it up and then all of a sudden she was asked to leave the job site. And that's not the solution either. You know what no, I mean? No, I don't wanna I don't wanna sound like I'm plugging, but uh, if safety was making money for you as a business that wouldn't happen. No, it wouldn't. And then the last thing I want to no. bring up, which I you just sparked this in my my head, was that I think whether you're a small company or you're a big company, there should be safety rehearsals. Yes, scenarios. A hundred percent. Like take don't, a day of the week or whatever, and don't even yeah. tell anybody. You just announce it. That's this is it. This yeah. is a safety rehearsal, a scenario. This is what happened. What does everybody do now? And yeah, every and I, everybody I, does I, it. I, I love it. I, I, I'm so glad you said that because like grab the risk assessment, go down to the to toolbox or go down on the shop floor and just throw the risk assessment on the ground and say, right, guys, just let leave that alone. Let's just look at, at ourselves doing a job today and let's just have a chat about whether it's safe or not safe or whether we can do it better. Yeah. And then at some stage, we'll go back to that paper and we, we'll, we'll say, that's rubbish. We can do this better and we can do it safer. And let's have that scenario and let's, and maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Maybe it goes back to what I said earlier on. Maybe we should be outsourcing that because true. there's too much risk for ourselves and there's better companies that can do that work. We're not having those conversations because we're just not. Because we're and so folks focused on finishing the task at hand, achieving the scope so then we can get our next payment draw. They're, they're yes. so focused on the business side of things. But then in the back of yeah. the head, Gavin, you know this from, from experience is that 
if you have an accident and someone actually dies, what does that do for your business? Oh, it, it, your your reputation is gone. We yeah. talk about brand safety. Like brand safety can be so valuable to a company. We've firsthand experience of seeing companies win massive contracts on the basis that they, yes, they can deliver from a quality point of view and they are on point. And, uh, but because of their safety reputation, we've seen companies win major projects with major clients and they were more cost, they cost more than other, than, than the other tenders. We've seen that. And I don't tell me, uh, nobody can tell me that uh, there isn't clients out there that will give you the extra small percentage because they know that you can deliver a safe project. And if, and if they, if you're telling me that, that those people don't exist in your environment, you're talking to the wrong clients. No, yeah, hundred percent. You're talking to the wrong clients. And, and, and everybody knows this. Whenever an accident does happen, you get the worker, you get the subcontractor, you get the contractor, you get the organization that had the job. You even get the client's name attached to it. That's yeah. all shared. That's all public knowledge yeah. at that point. And it ruins your brand. It totally ruins your yeah. brand. What I would like to see um, happening, and we're, 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 we're at a very early stage developing this concept is, we're developing a thing called one, uh, the One Safety Source Network. And what we want to do is we want to get all of these small contractors together and we want them to share all of their data with us within this community environment. And then we want to look at all this data and we want to then go back to all these guys and say, do you know what, guys, if you guys joined up as a network, you will actually become a bigger yeah. and better company yeah. as a network rather than as individuals. And, you know, you don't have to be fighting with each other and sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, undercutting each other. So what do I mean by that? So from a safety perspective, look at it from a point of view of where are you, where are you all buying your safety equipment right now? I don't know how much you're paying for that. Oh, well, I go into the local hardware or I go into, you know, um, whatever store and pick, you're going into a store and just picking it up randomly. Yes, we are. Yeah. Like, why have we all joined together and just had that. this conglomerate of yes. procurement together as a powerhouse where we all just say, right, let's go to Mr. PP of the world and say, we have 600 companies here. We've got buying power and we want you to deliver uh, our um, requirements all around the world. But we're going to award you a contract. I love it, Gavin. Honestly, that's that's smart. Yeah, that's very, very smart. So you guys are working oh, yeah. on that right now. We're working on that right now. So if anyone wants to get in touch with us, we we want to get as many people on board as possible. But we need the data. We need yeah. to see what people are spending, where they're spending it, how they're spending it, and then we can, you know, uh, challenge that and then you know put it together. There's no, we're not looking. There's no sign up fee here. This is a case of getting everybody together to show that if we come together as an industry, you know, just because these bigger companies, so called bigger companies, have taken the project management role. You, if you collaborate together, you can achieve so many things. And there's too much uh, segregation in the construction industry. There's too much fragmentation uh, in the industry. There's not enough collaboration going on. And that's why we're having accidents. And that's why people are going out of business. I agree. Uh, and it, it brings up another point that I think most people, when they think about safety, they just do the bare bones. And when yeah. I say bare bones, they might get a lid, they might get a respirator, and they might get a harness. And that's about it. That's the extent yeah. of it, right? But and a safety yeah. first aid kit, right? With bare bones. And I don't think that it, but in the same breath, you see these same people spending thousands and thousands of dollars on brand new tools and all kinds of little fancy little things that they need and all this other stuff. And why not spend the effort and research proper safety for the whole crew? Yeah. Yeah, love, yeah it's great. Yeah. Um on the on the on the book, the workplace safety on a budget, we talk about Recruitment. Why are your safety people spending eighty percent of their time in the office on on paperwork when they should be out having conversations in the field and just be talking to people? And then, well, this is just the nature it is because the legal industry and the insurance industry are driving hard for yeah. paperwork, more paperwork. You can't have enough. Okay, we'll go online. So we talk about going on to these gig economy platforms like Upwork.com and Fiverr and outsource all the paperwork to these very good professionals who are happy to sit in wherever part of the world, make sure that obviously you vetted them and, and we have in the past and get them to do most of the paperwork. So it frees up your guys' time. Now you've got a budget for doing the paperwork. Now you've got somebody that can do it for you that's costing less and allows your people to spend more time 
being out in the field and, and progressing safety as opposed to just becoming an administrator uh you know a super a super super well-paid administrator i might i might add shouldn't it be a daily thing gavin like shouldn't it all the trades people that are on a job site they should all be watching each other's back and walking around and seeing if they see something they should just speak up and just say something about it instead of ignoring it Yes, um, but human nature, uh, we're not going to get, we're, not, we're probably never going to get fully to that, to that point until everybody is on the same, talking the same language. And it starts from the client who's going to send, who's going to award a contract saying to people, you know, we're going to give you plenty of time. We're going to make sure there's plenty of money for everybody on this job. And we're going to give you the resources that you need in order to deliver this job safely, but you need to execute the job safely. That's the first conversation that happens and that's not happening. And then before the job even starts, we'd love to see, and we've, 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 we've facilitated this in the past where you get everybody together in one location off site, not near the site before the site even starts. I and mean, you have a workshop and you have a flip board or a flip chart there and you go, okay, guys, what do we want to achieve, achieve here in terms of health and safety? And let's go through all the stuff and let's go through all the issues that might affect this particular project. And let's agree how we're going to deal with those issues. And let's create a charter, if we like, for this project to say, here are the key goals for everybody for this project. Here's what we're going to, here's what we're going to sign up to. And then as you walk into this, the project have this big, fantastic whiteboard that has everybody's signature on it, that we've all signed up to the charter to say that we're going to deliver this job safely and here's how we're going to do it. And if you don't do it for whatever reason, at the end of the job, let's have another get together and let's have a lessons learned and say, look, what do we learn? What what can we do moving forward? And then move that momentum onto the next project and the next project and the next project. But that's that takes a it takes a very big shift for everybody to pull together like that. And How do we get takes, that mindset uh, going? How do you? Uh, it, 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 we go back to procurement. You yeah. can't be just handing out jobs and then expecting people to mobilize within the space of six, eight weeks or whatever it is. Like people just gen generally, even more so now than ever, than ever it was. People need time to mobilize and to plan for these jobs and to get ready for these jobs. They don't have the capacity Many of the companies don't have the capacity to tool up. And, that, and I mean, from a resourcing point of view, uh, to have people ready to execute these jobs. And they're firefighting before they even start. They're, they're in, and we've all been on those jobs where you you come into the job and you go, oh my God, you know, we're so far behind. Nothing is in place. We don't even have a compound. And yet we're start. We you know, we don't even have toilets, blah, blah, blah. And even if, if that stuff is in place, the people are still behind anyway because the program is so aggressive. And then so, it's just, it's you know, there's got to be some sort of... Sorry. It's gotta be, there's got to be some sort of a, of a watchdog in terms of how people are procuring projects and how they're winning projects and how they're handing out projects. And there must be some sort of a, a standard created that people are not allowed to progress onto a project without proper planning in place. But that's... That's outside of my scope. <laughs> or you at least should, if you actually are awarded the job, you now have to be awarded the safety of the job. So you have to prove to the uh, getting the job that you are going to adhere by all these safety standards that you're going to do this and you understand how everything like that. So it's not just a matter of you got the job because your numbers were good. Yes, correct. Um, that's, that's and we need to be hard. careful with that as well because yeah. I've seen people trying to implement that model and then what happens is they actually, if an accident happens, they kind of try and stuff it under the carpet because they don't want to tell people that they had a, an accident and wow. they, you know because it might affect the overall project or it might affect the, the numbers because, oh, we've got a million hours done on the project and we've had zero accidents. Have you? You know, are we all being truthful here? That's the other thing about it, right? So when people find creative ways to uh, bend the lie or bend the yeah. truth, sorry, bend the truth. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Kevin, uh, we're still going to pay you, but you're, you're, I, know, I know you can't come to work, but we're still going to pay you and we're going to make it out. Uh, you know, you're still going to sign that timesheet to say yeah, that we've you're, seen all you're that. still working. We, we've seen all that yeah. happen, I know, because that's, uh, 
That's where so that... what, 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 what message does that send out to the rest of the guys? He then talks to the rest of the guys. By the way, guys, I'm getting paid to stay at home, even though I broke my arm. Isn't this a great country? And everybody's having a laugh at safety. So and now keep your mouth quiet. And then maybe next month you'll break your arm and you'll have your time off and then yeah. you make money. Right. But that's not, that's not yeah. what we want. We, that's not progressing. No. And then we have a problem with safety then because um, people are, they turn off because they go, well, yeah, they, they talk to talk in here, but when something happens, it's all um, shoved under the carpet and, you know, uh, Hey, general contractors, renovation experts and construction professionals, Protecting your business should be a top priority. Your clients require you to have liability insurance as a condition of the contracts you sign. By having construction liability insurance, you not only fulfill those requirements, but also demonstrate professionalism, reliability, and a commitment to your clients' protection. It's a win-win situation for your business. Construction liability insurance is vital to protect you from risks and liabilities that come with your line of work. It provides essential coverage for property damage, coverage for third-party damage or bodily injury, and other incidents that may occur during construction or renovation projects. Visit zensurance.com forward slash save35 for a free construction liability insurance quote and get the comprehensive protection you need. So I, o- over there, Gavin, I don't know. Over here, it's been a difficult uphill battle that this show has done really well and it's grown really well, and I've been trying to get more and more politicians on the show. Yeah, because I want to ask these direct questions and I keep mm-hmm. getting uh, run around from these politicians and I'm trying to figure out how what else can I do to get these people on the mic to have these conversations to talk about this? Because I know you talk about, you know, procurement and everything like that, but these these jobs are being awarded, whether they're government or not. And there's a lot of unions involved. There's a lot of uh, moving parts involved. And like you said, like they nobody got hurt. Nobody got hurt, so but somebody did get hurt. We're just kind of washing this because we want to keep a nice safety record. Um, mm-hmm. Why don't we just actually just get these people to be accountable? How do we get these politicians to start realizing that? No, listen, not every job site is perfect. We need to make them better so then they're safer, so then everybody goes home. And that's, mm-hmm. that should be the mandate, not delivering this project on time, under budget or on budget or whatever, and, and, and hit your media sound bites. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. about that because media sound bites of a death, you know, they'll last a few days and that's the extent of it. And then they disappear. And that's the shameful yeah. part of it. But it goes back to the industry is fragmented. It's yes. too fragmented. Yes. That's the problem. You know, uh, the French are great at going out to the streets and protesting just because they might lose uh, 10 minutes of work because uh, of a productivity issue. So let's all go to the streets. <laughs> and they get a result they're very good at that <laughs> and they get the result <laughs> and i agree with you and that's what I, I had another guest on the show and he started uh, expressing the phrase unite the construction industry and i was like i totally agree like we yeah the, the industry needs to we're all brothers and sisters right we all well, want to do a good job and we all want to go home um but yeah. i mean we should all no. be watching each other's back let's look at uh, take take for example um the food industry uh, the agricultural sector are so politically uh, um, connected. Um, it's amazing how they can shape policy and sh- and you know rattle politicians when they need to rattle them because the power of the agricultural sector. Yet, one of the um, uh, the top um, fatalities and the top recurring uh, accidents are happening in guess where agriculture. in agriculture. So what does that tell you? It tells you two things. It tells you that if you have uh, a, u- a unified industry that is uh, connected, uh, you can pretty much dictate policy and you can keep the, the safety people away from um, annoying you if you think you're being annoyed um, and you're going to regress as an, as, a, as an industry because you're never going to progress the safety uh, within that industry. And... It's sad, but every year, every year without fail, the agriculture sector goes above the construction sector in terms of fatalities and in, and incidents and accidents in the workplace. Really, every does, year. Eh? it's yeah. been climbing ever since. Well, in in Ireland, uh, it's it's the top one. It's the top sector for fatalities and accidents every year. Wow. Every year, yeah. 
and nothing's really even being with done. all the building that's going on and it's 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 not just ireland it's it's crossed it's crossed so you know, there needs to be a there needs to be some sort of a a, 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 a joined up network uh to get people working together and not working and 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 you know as i said some people in very powerful positions are, are happy it's a bit like um i'm going to sound this is a bit of a, a a red herring comment but like um uh the english coined the phrase divide and conquer yeah and it's so true that if you create that division amongst people that you will conquer them because they're not joined up and that's the way the english obviously um became so successful of, of taking countries like ireland <laughs> back in the day <laughs> Um, I'm not going to go there. Uh, it's a different conversation. But That's like, a different conversation, and, and I'll just say yeah. that I'm on your side. Uh, I'll just say that, but uh, it's true, and, and it's just it's a shame because I look at the construction industry that – I've been fortunate enough through social media and through this show to speak to so many different people in North America, but also outside of North America. And yeah. we all speak the same language. Like construction is a, a language. Yeah. And we should be united. We should a hundred percent be united. And, and I know that there's people right now listening in Sweden. I know there's people listening right now that are in the Middle East and, you know, they're all over listening, South America, and they get it. They understand it. They're part of us. So they, they listen to what we're sharing and they know that our personalities, our character, we're like them. We're like them. So they're just like us. So then they go, I connect with you, but we should be, we should be united. But the problem is that you start getting into big construction which is the politicians, which are the corporations, which are the high rise, which are those segments. They yeah. dictate, they, they'll make the threats and they'll say, if you don't do this and you don't, or you shut up and like, it, like we're going to have a problem here kind of thing. And that's why you get unfortunate people like that been on the show that have been terminated in a roundabout yeah. way because they spoke up. Right. And, and it's unfortunate yeah. because you should get more and more people in this industry united. And I, I know for a fact that the younger generation coming in, this is a stumbling block for them. They don't want to yeah. rock the boat. They just want to do their job. And, and a lot of times it's unfortunate. And I'm sure you've seen this. They're asked to do yeah. something that's dangerous and they don't question it. And they just do it because they don't want to be terminated or they don't want to be called out on it. And they just do it. And then what happens? There's an actual accident. And you don't yeah. want that. And I've always told any yeah. young person getting started, question it. If you feel it doesn't, yeah. it's not right. It's not right. It's just bottom line. A hundred percent. But uh, look, uh, there's a ma- there'll always be a master and servant sort of relationship, um, no matter what we do. But you know, in this day and age, really, a master and a servant role? Are we still really at that? Are we still at that model mm-hmm. where there's a master and a servant? <laughs> like it's unfortunate. I know. You know, so so the unions are there to sort of create a sort of a a diplomacy between a, a diplomacy link between the employer and the and the empl- employer and the employee or the worker yeah some of these uh, schemes have been set up whereby you know it's creating this illusion that you know there's there's a, a tier system within construction so you have a tier one you have a tier two and you have a tier three type model but that's all to facilitate the bigger guys winning more, bigger contracts and continuing to win bigger contracts and then putting other people into other brackets and pushing them down and suppressing them. What we need is we need the workers to actually come together and say, right, let's all work together in one collaborative effort. And that can be global. It doesn't have to be in one country. It can be like, yeah, let's have this forum where people are coming together to share information, share projects, share equipment, share procurements, share tenders, share you know, in a collaborative way, that's not in, you know, yeah, go and win it on your own bat, but like, let's have this network where people are, you know, looking at everything, including health and safety as a one, as a one network approach, yeah. as opposed to having this fragmentation because it's killing you. It's absolutely in a physical sense and in a, in a business sense and a financial sense, it's killing people um, because, you know, the rug has been pulled under people and they're not able to recover from it. Gavin, I want to ask you uh, in all your research that you've done, which country or, or actually which city is actually doing <laughs> an amazing job of safety. 
you know, Canada uh, has a great record for health and safety as, as seen in the global market as having a good okay. standard for health and safety. I have to say that. Um, and um, Australia uh, do a real good good job. But um, from my experience, I love the Swedish model. Um, I was traveling to a project in Sweden and I had to read the legal framework. And I think it only lasts me about 20 minutes. <laughs> I was like, is that it? <laughs> is that really it <laughs> and I was like I was like ah because you know all these legal frameworks around the world have buried people with information and detail and, and it's kind of tied them up in knots whereas the Swedish just said like you know just you know assess the risk and make sure that it's controlled or it's eliminated what's the big deal after that like Pretty you know it's, I know I'm being sort of uh, I'm playing it down a little bit but like we don't have to complicate safety. It should, you know, if anything, let's just pair it back and let's just make it, you know, more usable, accessible, more practical for people so that people don't get disillusioned with safety. And unfortunately, in Canada and Australia and all these other areas that I see great things being done, there is a massive legal framework behind it that is just too complicated and too onerous and too litigious. And people, you know, no matter what you do, you, uh, unfortunately, the employer is going to be at fault according to these legal frameworks. And that's unfair. And, you know, that's, for, for what it's worth, I think um, uh, the legal profession have tied us up in knots with safety. I agree. I want to, Gavin, I wanted to ask you about, okay, so you're a small business and, and you, not necessarily you're, you're the owner, you may not be the right person to be the safety person. What, what are the qualities that you want to look for in somebody that should be the leader regarding the safety, regarding their organization, their business? What what yes. should that person be like? Okay, one word, empathy, for a start. Okay. If you don't have empathy, you shouldn't be doing health and safety. If you do not have empathy, stay away from it. If you don't have that as an individual where you empathize with that person and you see it from where they're, where they're standing, yeah, they might have done something wrong, it might have been just a day, a moment. Not everybody is going to be on high performance every day. And we all have down days. Of course. And, you know, if you don't have that empathy to realize where people are, you know, sometimes we get stuck into this rush of where we see someone do something wrong and next thing is, hey, what are you doing? And you're on that person straight away. And like, you don't know what that person's dealing with at home or has dealt with at home or whatever else, uh, you know, you and so if you've got an empathetic approach towards health and safety, you'll generally just find it'll, it'll flow. Health and safety will flow for you because you're doing it for the right reasons. You're not doing it for because there's great money and safety, which there is. And like we've seen the rates for health and safety has gone through the roof. If anyone's thinking of getting into a career, I'm not fully sure, or they're in a trade and they want to change out and they have a, a grow for safety and they have that empathy and they have that people, person, likability approach get into health and safety because there's a massive shortage of it globally and the rates are just you know they're off the charts in terms of the money and the salary it's good to know uh you you want to share some basic safety standards and regulations that that business owners should have that they should be mindful I, of? look there's the osha guidelines and there's the iso standards yeah. we always we we're kind of always beating the drum you know regardless of whether you you at the end of the day, that those standards travel throughout the world, yeah. regardless of whether you just want to stay in Canada and work in Canada or whether or you want to have a global reach. Those standards carry across the world and they do actually, if you embrace them in the right way and you don't use it like a shelf product, as in you take it off the shelf and you just say to somebody, just give it to me because I know I'll win contracts if I have that standard. If you do it with the right mindset and you embrace the standards and uh, you do it for the right reasons and you invest the time and energy to maintain that standard, that standard will stand to you throughout your whole business life. And and you anybody in your company should be able to put their hand on that standard and say, yeah, that's exactly how we do business in here. So one thing that I'm envious about with you guys in Ireland there is regarding roofers, because here, you know, some roofers are a little bit, cowboyish but i know that over there you guys set up scaffolding to do roofs 
and there's a whole right scaffolding there. crew, right? And and I I right, yeah. I try I want that here. I desperately want that here, but you won't be able to get the clients to pay for it. That's the problem because it's such a huge ad expense, but it's going to guarantee you that you're not going to have a fall, right? It's, it's not, not guaranteed, but it's going to be like very minimum. That's going to be a risk of anything happening, right? Well, it's not just scaffolding. They have also the airbags, the uh, inside the buildings, inside the houses as well. You'll, you'll see that they have the, I can't remember the exact terminology, but they're the, basically fall into onto the airbag. Um, if you fall through the rafters, um, some might say that that's a bit of an overkill. They right. also have safety nets. Some some people uh, use the safety nets, but the logic behind that money is: how can you say that you can stand over your risk assessment when the principles of risk assessment is eliminate the hazard? The very first step is to eliminate the hazard. Yes, exactly. Hello. That's how you start. Like, yeah. So you're. You know, you're you're actually uh, breaching legislation by not having the scaffold. It's not that we're ahead of everybody else. Whether they like it or not, scaffolding had to be included in the price back to procurement. You've just said it yourself. People won't pay for it. Yeah. So safety gets damaged because people won't factor in health and safety at a procurement level. We're, by the time the job, the purchase order is given and the guys on the on on the job, it's too late. Safety is already in reverse. Are you a fan? I know that they're coming from Europe and they're coming here this way. We're having uh, hearing protection, uh, Bluetooth enabled hearing protection. So now you can communicate with each other on a radio device instead of speaking to each other. But I don't know for a fact if they actually, I'm seeing a lot more guys in it, and this is nice to hear. A lot more tradespeople here in Canada are listening to this show all day long while they're working. It's kind of a double edge for me because now you're not focused on the actual job site and your attention regarding your hearing is put elsewhere. There's also a flip side to that. Okay. Um, we've seen it working in the areas of like, say for example, a printing company in manufacturing or, you know, sort of printing whatever. And that's really where the main industry where you see that those guys wearing the Bluetooth. And the job is so mundane, it's so drone, it's hard to put a shift in for the whole day. Yeah. And, you know, having this sort of buddy in terms of, you know, the, the radio and having that connection and listen to a talk show or listen to the podcast can actually sort of make the day a bit better. So, yeah, I wouldn't, if, 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 so, if, I'm, if I have somebody's life in my hands, that's I wouldn't different. want to know that they're listening to a podcast or to Spotify. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, I agree uh, with you that if it's I, a, if it's a if it's a cog, if it's a turning cog occupation and there's noise, and then yeah, you, you might as well listen to some other stuff. So then you can actually make the day better. Yes. Yes. I but agree. but I everything has a place so long as everybody comes together and is involved in the decision making process. So you get the Bluetooth devices and you uh, put, so back to the business of safety, you go you go back and you say to the guys, right, we're thinking about introducing these Bluetooth devices. Go to your supplier and say, look, throw in a few samples. We'll have a look at it. We'll have the lads use it and we'll come back to you and let you know what what the, what the what we'll do a survey and see what the guys think. And then we'll, we'll mark that based out on cost, production and safety. Yeah. Okay. This is back to the business of safety. And we do an and we analyze it to that point. And then we say to ourselves, oh, right, we think safety might be affected by this, but production will go up. So now you have to weigh up, how do you solve that issue? And so you might turn around and you might say, I might say, or I might advise the company and say, why don't you have intermittent health and safety messages fed through the system on a daily basis that talks about- That's a great you idea. Know, have you tied off your harness? Yeah, that's a great idea. Are you idea. sure that you've, you've done your JSA for this job? We value you as as a as a business owner, and by the way, we have a message from Katie, your daughter, who says, "Come home safe, Daddy. We want to see you later on today." That's a great idea. I love it. Yeah, so I totally agree with you. So I'm I'm back on those headsets now. You know what I mean? Because it, yeah. it makes a lot of sense at that point. I like it. Well, the guys might turn around and say, "No, we don't like using. They're too sweaty. They're too heavy, and they're in the way." And and that's fine. People say that that's fine, 
but we can't force things on people. We can't sort of put our bias uh, on it. You have to just sort of like, we we looked at it, we tried to implement it. It didn't go well. Uh, we might look at it again in the future, but um, the analytics say to us that all the boxes weren't ticked. That's fine. That, I have no issues with that. Another company might say, no, they're brilliant and you really missed the trick here. Fine. That's a different culture that you've developed within your own company, and those people within your company have embraced that. But we have a different culture in our in our company, and not enough has been done to create a model within your business that is a culture of how you actually do business. So, what do I mean by that? How do you act? How do you speak? How do you talk? How do you interact? How do you you maneuver your company as a as a company, and what does that look like? And then how do you shape those conversations in such a way that everybody thinks and talks the same way? We don't do enough of that in, in businesses. But if you did, you'll what, what will come out of that is a very good culture. And it doesn't have to be a safety culture. It can be just your business culture. And safety would be part of that. But everybody in the business, no matter who you are, no matter what level you're at, all feeds into that culture. I want to paint and a if somebody if, if, Sorry? Sorry, if somebody, somebody decides that they... They want to be an outlier and they want to be a maverick. Well, then they don't belong in the company and there's not enough of that done either where you kind of pull that person in and say, look, if you don't, if you don't come with us into what we're trying to achieve here, we actually, even though you're brilliant and you are a brilliant worker, we're actually going to have to let you go. Yeah. And then they're not, you know, people are like, oh, you can't get rid of him or her because, you know, she's brilliant at this job. I don't care. I'd rather lose one person for the sake of the other 100 or 50 yeah. or 20 people that's in the business. Yeah. I want, I want you to paint me a picture, Gavin, about the future. If we don't start making safety a bigger priority versus if we do, what's the future of construction going to look like for both scenarios? Um, we're going to kill people uh, on, on, a, a, on a very high level over and over again. And we're going to create more and more separation between the big multinational construction companies and the small to medium medium guys, because they're going to go out of business and they're going to, they're the ones that are going to be the fall guy because the big guys are just going to move, ahead, move away. And uh, to, to coin the phrase, everybody's replaceable and you are. And so, you know, if people don't start coming together and actually, you know, having a very serious look at the industry and coming together in, in a joined up network, uh, um, we're going to, we're not going to solve the problem. No. So how do we begin? We just start communicating with each other. Start listening to the show. Start talking Create, to other people. Yeah. That's it. Here you go. Here you go. What, like you didn't think that this conversation was going and I didn't think this conversation was going to lead into where all the different top, topics and areas we've gone. And people probably think, Oh, here's health and safety. It wasn't a health and safety discussion. It was a, it was a life discussion. It was a business discussion. It was a, how do I make more money? How do I become more efficient? Yeah. How do I become more safe yeah. discussion? And, you know, if we just start at a local level and people get together and they get a, a, as many companies together and say, look, we, there's, there's, there's something in this. Why don't we create a district for ourselves? And then that district becomes a branch and a branch becomes a city and a city becomes a region and a region becomes a country. Then that's we have a network. Starts. That's how it works. Totally. Yeah. Did we, we're getting close to the end here, Gavin. Did we cover everything? I cover quite a bit. I was just curious and you're right. I mean, most of the time we do these shows and it's not necessarily I'm on a guided path of what I want to talk about. We just kind of, we just get talking, but I, I love what we spoke about. I love what you shared and uh, I definitely encourage people to check out the book and we'll put the link in there as well too. So into the show notes so people can check it out. But is there anything else you want to share just before I get into the 12 questions of construction? Um, no, um, I want to know, is that Santa Claus on your T-shirt there or what is that? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's Adam, right? So it's, he's got a beard. He's actually a plumber, right? So he's got these stickers okay. and I'm wearing his T-shirt. So he actually has these stickers and he, he sneaks them everywhere on different job sites to just remind people that he was just here, right? So he's that's well, his, look, that's I, his I've asked the question. I've asked the question. So <laughs> it's obviously working. It's obviously working. It could be Santa Claus, but uh, and funny enough is he's Irish too. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah, that's okay, funny. Go. All right. No, thank you so much, Gavin. So just let me uh, share the deets again. Gavin Coyle, again, CEO and founder of the Coyle Group. 
uh, thought leader, speaker, and safety mentor. Uh, been doing it for quite a while, man. Uh, www.gavin-coil.com and also www.coil-group.com. And you can email him with any questions. You're you're inviting everybody to send you emails and, and just chat. Uh, Gavin at yeah. gavin-coil.com. And then you find them on LinkedIn. You find them on IG under Gavin Coil number 10. And then on YouTube, the channel is called Safety CEO. You ready for the 12 questions? Go for it. What's your favorite construction word? Safety. Of course. No, but yeah, I had to, had to say that though, <laughs> you didn't I? Um, what is your least favorite construction word? Um, unsafe. Um, <laughs> what you know, you're hitting me between the two eyes here with these questions. Um, <laughs> really are. Uh, what turns you on in construction? Turns out, can you define what what do you mean by what excites on? you? What excites? What, what do you what like about? It? Yeah, I love the fast paced dynamic uh, nature of of construction, and when it's pulled together in the right format and in the right conditions, there's no better place to be than a really good job that's moving and has momentum, and everything is just you know brilliant. Everything's on point. Safety's on point. People are making money production's on point the job's making is a success there's no better place to be than uh, a job that's really going well yep. what turns you off in construction people that don't plan don't plan for safety what's your favorite curse word fuck what's your favorite vehicle anything in the world I have to say, uh, I own a XC90 Volvo, obviously safety. So. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> I your... sound boring, don't they? No. Yeah. What's your least yeah. favorite vehicle? Least favorite vehicle? Um, I would say uh, a Tesla. You're not the first. Don't worry. There's been plenty of people on the show share that same sentiment. <laughs> uh, what's, what construction sound or noise do you love? Sorry? What construction sound or noise do you love? Um, a generator. Because <laughs> it shows it. we have electricity on the job. <laughs> exactly. You got power. What construction yeah. sound or noise do you hate? The a jackhammer. Obviously, it has to be a jackhammer. Loud. What profession, yes. other than your own, would you like to attempt one day? Uh, DJ. DJ. Yeah. What profession would you not like to do? I would not like to. There's a lot of jobs I wouldn't like to do. Um, I definitely wouldn't like to be working in an abattoir because I did do it at one stage. And I, I don't know how those guys do that work. I do not know wow. how they do that work. How long did you do that for? I done it for a summer uh, uh, while I was in school. Wow. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah, last question a, an industry <laughs> last question if heaven exists what would you like to hear god say when you arrive at those pearly gates you you picked the wrong door <laughs> gavin thank you so much man absolute pleasure having you on the show man yeah i really enjoyed it money it was a great conversation thank you really uh, i hope people take um something out of it um you know just go back and look at your business look at your business from an analytical point of view and break it down piece by piece and look at what is making the best impact for your business and what's not making the best impact for your business and just try and sort of get it into uh, focus your area and your money in the right direction and mind yourself and be safe that's it that's all it is thank you very much don't go anywhere just yet angelina we're out of here